to the life here. Well, there's no junior church. One more Sunday off. Um, would you turn in your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 8? And if your children need an activity bag or you want to go back and get one for them, they're back there in the corner. And uh, don't worry, you won't interrupt me one bit. Beginning a new section in the book of Matthew. Uh, this is about Jesus' kingdom authority but how it's carried out in a very special way. That is, in love. There will also be a sub-theme uh, as we go through this on what is faith. Let pick up verse 1, Matthew 8. We'll read through 17. When he came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cured of his leprosy. And then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself in the uh, to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. And when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed and in terrible suffering. And Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. But just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to those following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, it will be done just as you have believed it would. And his servant was healed at that very hour. And then Jesus came to Peter's house. He saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she got up, and she began to wait on him. When evening came, many, were, uh, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and carried our disease, or diseases. When I was in high school, my mother's father in Florida died. She had previously lost her mother. At the same time, my father had gotten a visit from some of the guys in the office over there in Lansing, Michigan. We were still in Racine. That he would be, uh, I was pretty sure he was going to be losing his job. Um, work was not coming in like it had once uh, and I realized that during recessions, architecture and construction are the first to hit, and that's what my father's line of work was. When I asked my mother if she was flying to Florida for the funeral, she said, no, I want to see how things turn out with Dad, which was half true. Uh, what she didn't tell me was that she also wanted to see how things turned out with me. Unbeknownst to me, the school had confiscated a hash pipe if that's new to you, just go to State Street, download the pipe fitter, and you'll figure out what that's all about. And uh, some hash. And they had turned it into the police department, and so my father and I had to go down to the police department. I can barely remember it, but I do remember it was a very sterile gray room, and we had to meet with some authority there. And as it turned out, the man didn't bust me. He gave me a warning. What I remember most was how my father or my parents treated me after that incident. There wasn't much conversation in the car as my father drove me home. Uh, he must have been processing it all. But when we got home, my parents dealt with me in a very firm, straight, but loving way. And by loving, I meant, I mean that they didn't scream or yell or swear at me. They spoke directly out of concern for me and my life. 
To be honest, I don't remember even being grounded, though they may have done that. I just don't remember. At that age, what good would it have done? My mind was pretty well made up. I will never forget my mother's sacrifice. In fact, I told this story at her funeral. Christ, in the few years uh, that my parents had been saved, had changed them. Uh, what they experienced was authority and love working together. Uh, this is how they expressed themselves, and I was learning a big lesson. They were scared. They were scared about Dad's job, about me. Uh, they were direct, and they were concerned about me and my salvation. I was not saved at the time. In Jesus, we see the perfect blending of authority and love. All authority was given to him, and yet he used his power in love. And as the disciples watched, because they're now learning and picking up all the things they need to know, as they go out in kingdom authority, how they are going to minister to people, we enter now, as I said, a new section of Matthew. Jesus has delivered the Sermon on the Mount, and the result was that the multitude were amazed, for he taught as one with authority. You need to underscore that. Not as their scribes. Jesus' words had authority, and now he's going to reveal that authority indeed. The kingdom of God has broken into time, and it is now time for Jesus to reveal it. He comes down from the mountain and enters, if you will, the valley of men. He chooses to reveal his power by healing people. Three healings are recorded here. Uh, since physical sickness is a result of the fall and the reign of sin, he shows how he came to overturn its reign in healings. And the first healing is that of a leper. Each healing, by the way, is an indication of how vast his kingdom is. It crosses all boundaries. So first we have Jesus crossing the boundary of purity or uncleanness. We all have an idea of what leprosy uh, is, so I won't explain it. It was a dreaded disease, and one who had it was a societal and religious outcast. You mentioned lep leprosy, and people would gasp, much as we did when we first learned of AIDS. The leper was removed from the people, and when people passed by, they would have to shout out, unclean, unclean. He was a loner, but long forgotten the power of human touch and love. He was kept away from the community. He was also kept away from the temple. He could not worship with God's people. Somehow, however, this leper made his way to the front of the crowd so that he might be healed. And in kneeling before Jesus, he says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And they, by the way, it doesn't use the word heal because he was considered uh, ceremonially unclean. This man did what was wrong, you know. He got close to people. And Jesus broke the rules by touching him. But that is what Jesus did. He had complete authority, and his authority was witnessed in the kindness of a touch. How long had it been since this man known human touch? Now, normally Jesus would have become unclean or ceremonially unclean, but his kingdom crossed that barrier. He made the unclean clean without becoming unclean himself. Now here's the sub-theme, and I hope you know, you've all watched movies where there's the main theme and then there's the sub-theme. Uh, we watched a movie the other day and just gave up. There were so many sub-themes we couldn't even keep it straight, but we're only going to have two, okay? And I want to talk about faith, uh, starting with this man's faith, the centurions, and then Peter's mother-in-law. Each point will have a sub-point here. This man did not doubt Jesus' ability to heal him. He does not ask to be healed. He does not say, can you heal me? No, rather he makes a statement about Jesus' cleansing power and his willingness to heal him. His faith was not something he wound up within himself. His faith was objective. It was in a person the person Jesus. Christians get confused. 
They think faith is something they drum up within themselves. They think it is some feeling of inner power. And if they can just get there, you know, great things are going to happen. So if they can drum up great faith, great things will happen. What does that lead to? Spiritual pride. Because there are those who really think they are more spiritual and of greater faith than others. Um, True faith, on the other hand, admits our powerlessness and our complete dependence on God. Faith, therefore, is humble in nature. Faith doesn't look within. It looks to Christ, who can do all things. Faith also accepts God's will. We can't push God's hand. People say to themselves, well, maybe I didn't pray hard enough. Maybe I didn't have enough faith. It's not about how much faith we can create. Faith is objective. It's in the power of Christ and his will. And so the leper says, if you are willing. And Jesus said, I am willing. So we live, don't we, in a bit of a tension here when it comes to healing, some ambivalence. We pray knowing Jesus is all-powerful, and at the same time, is he willing? Many healings don't take place until people go to heaven. Now, we experience healings, and other times we don't. And heaven is the final place for healing. So we can't live defeatist lives when things don't go as we have prayed. I'll talk more on this later at the end. When the leper was cleansed, Jesus told him to keep a lid on it. Uh, He was instead to go to the temple and there to testify. He was to keep the law and offer a sacrifice because now he was clean, but he was also to testify to what happened. And he was to tell the people, uh, the priest and so forth, that Messiah had come and that the kingdom of God has broken in. Second healing happens to do with the centurion's servant, and we see Jesus crossing the boundaries of race. Our leper friend is Jewish. Our centurion friend is a Gentile. So Jesus follows the order to the, Gent- or to the Greek first, or to the Jew first, and then to the Gentile. The centurion is not only a Gentile, he is a Roman military officer. Rome was the enemy, the great oppressor. This great divide, however, did not keep this man from seeking Jesus, nor does it keep Jesus from crossing over. You see, Jesus' kingdom is universal, and he often goes to the marginalized. Jesus' king um, uh, crosses all boundaries, and so the centurion was close to his servant, and he asked Jesus to heal him. Jesus, therefore, is willing to go to his home. By the way, that's a no-no. Jews don't fraternize with Gentiles, but Jesus is going to cross that boundary anyway. But the soldier stops him, and he says, you know, I'm not worthy to have you in my home. And he also knew something about authority. All Jesus had to do was say the word, and his servant would be healed. And so Jesus healed with his word. By the way, trace the word all the way through Scripture from Genesis onward. That word that spoke creation into existence is the word that healed these people. Then Jesus makes a comment in verse 10 about this soldier's faith. Why was it so great? Here's the side theme again. One, because his faith was a humble faith. I am not worthy. And it wasn't in himself, it was completely in Jesus. Faith is not what we can wind up within ourselves. It is total dependency upon God. It's not about how much faith we can create. It's cast solely on a person, Jesus Christ. We have a picture uh, following uh, about two types of faith, a very prideless faith and a prideful faith. He says that those who are going to be at the banquet in the end are from the east in the West, who is he talking about? He's talking about the Gentiles, man. He's talking about all nations are going to come to this banquet. And who's going to be left out? The sons of the subjects of the kingdom. And that's Israel. Now, we know that Jews have come to Christ. In fact, the first disciples were, were Jewish. But the nation as a whole received him not, says John. 
And so Jesus says right here, it's those who have no pride in themselves and are just thankful to be saved, the Gentiles, who are going to be at the banquet. And those who think they've had it all along and are very prideful about it and it's a shoe in they're not going to be there. So Jesus is full of surprises, you know. I mean, he lets us know that God's kingdom love crosses ethnic barriers. He lets us know it's universal, and he lets us know that it often goes to the marginalized. And he lets us know that real faith um, is and what it isn't. Third healing happens in the household of Peter. Here we see Jesus' kingdom authority crossing gender lines. Now, that may mean anything to us now, but it was huge back then. Peter's mother-in-law was ill with a fever. Peter, by now, it seems, has moved to Capernaum, and his mother-in-law is living with the family. Unlike the former two people, there is no mention of her asking to be healed. Uh, You know, I kind of picture her as the person in Romans chapter 8 who's just hurting and suffering and groaning, if you will, and unable to to pray. It was her family that requested, we find that in Luke 4, for her to be healed. And Jesus again touches her, and she is healed. And it seems that he really healed her because she doesn't need a day or two to recover. You're running a fever. You, you, you have recovery time. But not her. How was her faith revealed? Here's the sub-theme again. It was revealed in grateful service. So why did Jesus heal her? Was it because he wanted her to fix a meal? I kind of doubt it, okay? Was it to show that Peter, the first pope, was married? I don't think so. I don't think they had that in mind at all. No, Jesus is making a statement about his kingdom authority, that the kingdom of God has come. It has broken into time, or erupted, if you will, into time. And what they are witnessing is the foretaste of what is to come. We have entered in the age to come and we're following it to its completion. They are witnessing what Jesus came to do and that is to quash the kingdom of sin and its sorrows, such as sickness and pain. He came to change the course of history and the curse. Go home and read Joy to the World. That's what it's all about. Okay, Christ coming, ushering in his kingdom and reversing the course of history and the curse. And he came to redeem all people, outcasts, Gentiles, women. And they're all to become equal in kingdom service. So if we are a part of the kingdom now, then we ought to be uh, as we will be in the new heavens and the new earth. The future must be affecting now because we're already in the age to come and we're looking for its completion. So the completion ought to be affecting how we are living now in part. Who knows the glory of pottery? Few of you? (laughs) No? What are we teaching people in our Bible churches? Okay? It's an old, old song. But the lyrics go like this. As it was in the beginning, it is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen, amen. You were afraid I was going to sing it. I'll, I'll say it again. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. The kingdom of God has erupted into time, and we are moving forward with it until we witness it in its fullness, that is, the eternal state. So church life must resemble in ways what is to come. You know, the temple had all these divisions in it. There was the courtyard for men. There was a courtyard for women. There was a courtyard for Gentiles. And people like the leper were kept out by the outer walls. But in Christ, all those walls have come down. Sounds like a Reagan speech. Remember that one? In Christ, all those walls have come down. Now, I will let you work out the details on that. That is just how egalitarian or complementarian you are going to be. But it is sure food for thought when it comes to home life and serving in the church. In conclusion, and I have a bit of a long one, Matthew concludes this section with a 
fulfillment verse as he has repeatedly uh, through this book. Uh, it is his custom to say this was done in order that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Basically, that Christ came to take the sins of the world upon him that we might be free from sin and sorrow. Some would say because of this verse, because Isaiah 53 also talks about the substitutionary death and so forth of Christ, that he not only took our sins upon himself, but our sicknesses. Hence, we are not only healed from sin, but from our many sicknesses. But is that what we experience? Now, I'm appealing to experience. I know you're supposed to appeal to the Word of God, and I will in a minute. But is that what we experience? No. Uh, and what are we to say if we are not healed, that we did not drum up enough faith? I don't like that conclusion. This is, however, not what Matthew is doing in, from Isaiah 53. He is simply saying that Christ went to the cross to reverse the course of the curse and the reign of sin. Now we experience only it, it only in part. Diseases, death, life's inefficiencies, the dramas, you know, because of the fall, are all there because of sin. And that is the real problem. What miracles Jesus performed, what healings we experience now, what answers to prayer are a glimpse of the final healing we will know in eternity. Then everything will be perfect, but not now. Jesus gave us a picture of his kingdom, power, and love, the breaking in of his kingdom. But Jesus did not heal everyone, nor did his disciples. So the real culprit is sin. Sin and all its repercussions. So we need to admit that there is a sin sickness. A sickness that leads to outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth. We therefore need a great Savior, Jesus Christ. And we need to place our faith in him. So if you are here today and you still have not done that, that you would let him in and reign within your heart. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Whatever it taught us today, can we take that thing home and think about it so that we would find some little part of change in our lives for you. And we pray through Christ. Amen.